And again, welcome to the seminar on corporate governance hosted by the Investment Division of the Ministry of Finance. I would like to take a moment to introduce persons at the head table. The Honorable Minister of Finance, Vincent Dukaran, Permanent Secretary of the Investment Division, Mrs. Marlene Juman, and Advisor to the Minister of Finance, Mr. Philip Marshall. I will ask, now ask Mrs. Juman to come to give her opening and welcome remarks to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. The Honorable Winston Dukaran, Minister of Finance, members of the head table, permanent secretaries, chairman, directors, CEOs of state agencies, distinguished guests, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to extend a warm welcome to each of you to this seminar on governing the state enterprise. We recognize that you as chairman, directors, and CEOs of state companies have the responsibility for leading your company. And with the increasing demands for effective service delivery, greater transparency and accountability, we know that your task is not an easy one. Some of you would have been provided service on boards at previous times, but by and large, most of you are new board members. And even as we recognize that many of you have been to various seminars on good governance, we at the Ministry of Finance cannot discard our responsibility to ensure that you are prepared, given all the tools and all the support from the Ministry of Finance to assist you in carrying out your duties. As you know, the Minister of Finance was incorporated as Corporation Soul by Act No. 5 of 1973. This act enables the attachment of rights and duties and the transfer of real or personal property to the minister in his official capacity. Any property invested in the minister's corporation soul is held in trust for the state. As corporation soul, therefore, the minister of finance is responsible for the state's entire portfolio of investments, of which the state enterprise sector is a major element. All state enterprises incorporated under the Companies Act are therefore accountable to the Minister of Finance. In this capacity, the Minister has responsible for a number of areas such as the policy direction of the state enterprise, the financial policy of the state enterprises, the appointment and removal of boards of directors, establishing new enterprises, and winding up enterprises that are no longer required. And it is through the Investments Division of the Ministry of Finance that the minister monitors the performance of the state enterprise sector. And so you will recognize that a state agency may have two reporting relationships, one with its line minister who has direct responsibility for the agency, and the other to the Minister of Finance as Corporation Sue. So today's seminar will focus on more of the operational issues, and we will focus on basically the general policy and guidelines applicable to the state agency as outlined in the monitoring manual. We have a presentation on procurement, which is always a challenging area and a source of conflict if not managed properly. And we also have a presentation by the Integrity Commission, which is important for all directors and persons in public office. The seminar will provide you with some essential tools to assist you in understanding your role, functions, and obligations. We have a shared responsibility for making decisions objectively in the best interest of the company and by extension, the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. I would like to reinforce the importance for leaders of the state enterprises to institute within their corporate culture, ethics, and a code of best practice that will focus on transparency, accountability, and responsibility for actions. Ladies and gentlemen, good governance has moved beyond the theoretical and is now internationally recognized as fundamental to the success, progress, and development of any economy. It demands a holistic approach, one that is dependent on the involvement of all parties. It requires extensive and continuous training of our leaders so that we are aware of the developments in the industry. The Ministry of Finance stands with you in this regard 
and trust that this morning session will be beneficial to all. Thank you for being with us here today, and we encourage full and fruitful discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre Juman. I would now like to invite the Honorable Finance Minister Winston Dugrand to deliver the feature address in today's Corporate Governance Seminar. Minister Dugrand. Well, good morning to everyone, and thank you very much, Dominic, and our Permanent Secretary, Marlene Juman, members of the boards of the corporation sector in the government, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. This is going to be a very exciting day for the managers of the public enterprise system in Trinidad and Tobago. We hope that during the course of today, we would have a hands-on exchange between you who are responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the state enterprises and us in the Ministry of Finance, given my responsibility as corporation sole on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. The seminar is entitled Corporate Governance Seminar, and to some extent it raises this issue of good governance, focusing on good governance in the context of the corporate entities. But good governance has a much wider frame within which we must operate. Some have argued that Good governance is too high a set of ideals for countries and that we can be satisfied with good enough governance. The truth is, in today's society, good governance is really driven by people's expectations. And it is the people's expectation which we must honor. If there is no demand for good governance, there's likely, there's hardly likely to have a good supply of good governance. And in today's world, in which our society has become even more sensitive to the way in which the public affairs are managed, there is an increasing demand for good governance which indeed places the yardstick against which we must supply that good governance. And today, you will be discussing how that good governance in the corporate sector of the state enterprise could improve the delivery that is required of you by the society that will enhance the capacity to so do, that will, at the same time, ensure that there is accountability, that you make the right public choices, and that you operate with the highest level of efficiency. Those are the various components of corporate good governance that we'll be focusing upon during the course of the day by many who have specialized in these areas, but now you're all specialists in your specific responsibility. The Permanent Secretary quickly outlined the role of the corporate soul, corporation soul. It is a constitutionally appointed position and requires the Minister of Finance, whoever he or she may be, to take full responsibility 
for the way in which the assets of the state through the corporations that have been established are effectively managed. And as was, as was pointed out, there is dual responsibility between the line minister and the minister of finance on these matters. What are the expectations for the corporation's soul in the discharge of this constitutionally subscribed duty? The first expectation is that in the final analysis, I and through, through myself, with your support, we are accountable to Parliament. The Parliament is the institution to whom we account for our performance, our outcomes, as well as for our plans for the future. So the first expectation is accountability to Parliament. The second expectation has to do with the adherence to government policy. In each area, there is a prescribed policy framework much of which is being developed by yourselves, but in the final analysis, there must be a clear policy direction. The third expectation has to do with measuring performance outcomes. And I use the word outcomes deliberately and distinct from the word output. For in today's nomenclature on management, the issue of outcomes is what we measure. Outcomes is what benefit it brings to the society. And the fourth expectation is that we must all comply with what we call acceptable public values in the discharge of our duty. Those are the expectations that form the demand for good governance and the responsibility of all of us to discharge in accordance with these broad expectations. In order to be able to perform the functions to discharge these expectations of a modern society in a modern time, there are a number of functional requirements. The first has to do with the question of using the public office which you hold to create opportunities for adding value to the society and ensuring that we can stand the test of competitiveness against established benchmarks, whether those ben benchmarks are of a local nature, a regional nature, or an international nature. So that's one of the functions that we must embark upon on a day-to-day -day basis. And chairmen of the board are charged with the responsibility to provide the leadership so that these this particular objective can be achieved. The second function is to enhance shareholder value. And I use the word shareholder value deliberately in order to incorporate the public interests as well as the interests of the owners of the shares, which essentially is the government operating on behalf of the people. Enhancing shareholders' value, therefore, is one of your major functions that must be performed. And the third one that sometimes we have been loosely adhering to is now the complete financial accountability of state enterprises. And during the course of today, I'm sure you will go into the details of the demands of financial accountability. The corporation's soul is largely responsible for financial accountability, whereas the line ministers 
are responsible for the wider operations of the company. A brief assessment of the metrics of the state enterprise sector would suggest that it is significant in Trinidad and Tobago. And by the state enterprise sector, I include the Special Purposes Committee, but we exclude the statutory bodies on the basis of the data I will now share with you. If we were to include it, then of course, it will show an even more pronounced role of the state sector. The total annual revenue of the state sectors defined in the way I have defined it is in the vicinity of $48 billion. The overall profit is in the vicinity of $3 billion. The total dividends that are paid to the Treasury is in the order of $1.2 billion. The total assets of the order of $120 billion. And the government of Trinidad and Tobago equity is in the order of $7 billion. The number of persons employed, 16,000. And the total debt of state enterprises is $13 billion. These metrics which I have outlined merely signal the fact that this is a significant sector. And underlying the size of this sector is the role of the state in economic development. And I will say just a few words on that before I end. What are some of the operating principles that will guide us in the discharge of this duty on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. In the first instance, there is what we call a performance monitoring manual, which I know has been circulated to you with some revisions that we have made within the last few months. To some extent, the, oper the performance monitoring manual is the framework within which your operating decisions are to be made and must be consistent with. And within the context of the performance manual, there is what is referred to as a project management protocol. The performance manual Monitoring manual represents the framework for the oversight of state enterprise sector. It is important to note that the manual highlights standard procurement procedures. It also establishes guidelines to facilitate the state with information on expenditure, communication, and reporting on actual performance of the enterprise as well as its strategic plans and proposals for significant capital expenditure. Within this context, there is, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the project management protocol, which focuses on ensuring that the infrastructure projects are effectively managed against benchmarks that have been agreed upon and standards that have been settled by the relevant authority in the government to ensure that there is a reduction in cost overruns and to ensure that there is high quality in the product. To some extent, there has been an advance in the scope of accountability envisaged in these manuals to embrace investment policy of a more far-reaching far nature. And in that sense, we have added new responsibilities 
to that particular function. Of very critical importance, and one that has on very many occasions been underrated, is the establishment of the role of the Audit Committee. The Audit Committee of Boards are mandated to assist the Boards in a number of very specific measures, and because of its importance, I would outline them. Monitoring their, monitoring their financial reports and other financial information provided by the company to any government body or the public. Evaluating the company's system of internal controls regarding finance, accounting, legal, compliance, and ethics that management has established. Three, overseeing the company's auditing, accounting, and financial reporting processes. And it is important that the audit committee provide the necessary resource to discharge these functions on an ongoing basis. Public procurement must not stall the process of decision making, but it must adhere to the fundamental principles of transparency in so doing. And as you are well aware, new public procurement reform legislation is currently before a joint selective committee of parliament, soon to change that system. But in the meantime, the current system, which has served us well in the context of the times of the past, would have to be adhered to with a level of seriousness. It is against this kind of background that I am sure that you will be discussing all these issues in great detail. But I want to make two additional points before I close in these introductory remarks. One has to do with what I refer to as the role of the state. In our public expenditure program, we allocate almost the same amount of expenditure to state enterprises for capital expansion as we do for the public sector investment program, which is controlled by central government. To be precise, in the last budget, we allocated $7 billion in the public sector investment program and an equivalent amount of $7 billion in the public enterprise system. This underlines the fact that the public sector has a critical role in fostering economic growth. For underlying capital expenditure is the basis upon which economic growth will resume in Trinidad and Tobago. And therefore, you have a key responsibility in ensuring that that expenditure is done in a manner that triggers economic growth and development. But in so doing, the role of the state has come into focus. In the budget of 2011, I was very careful to outline that the role of the state must now be a catalytic one in the sense it must take such decisions and embark on such programs that will be a catalyst for development and growth on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And that is why we had embarked on a policy directive to do what we refer to as public offerings in Trinidad and Tobago. There must be a flexibility to change. And that program of flexibility to change has begun in a small way, but will be accelerated during the course of the next fiscal year. 
The public offerings program of which I speak about, and which was announced conceptually in the last budget, has three major objectives. One is to ensure efficiency in the use of the assets of the state. And you know what is required to do so. Secondly, to generate an environment for the sharing of ownership of the people in the resources that belong to the people through the state. And thirdly, a development objective of building the capital market for further capital accumulation in years to come as required to ensure sustainability of the growth process. These are the changes that are before us as we embark on this new and exciting journey at this time in this country's economic history. It is based on a new kind of strategic thinking on the part of the board, a reassertion of the need to ensure that there is accountability for the discharge of your duty, and an overriding responsibility to build confidence in our future. That is what we are about, and that is what you have accepted by offering yourself to be chairman and members of the board of the state enterprise sector. In today's world, I want to sincerely thank you for such an offering. For there must be within each one of you a sense of public duty. And it is that sense of public duty would have propelled you into the acceptance of this responsibility. It's a public duty beyond your own individual interests. It's a public duty that I know you have accepted because you know tomorrow can be a better tomorrow for us and for those who will come thereafter. I thank you for accepting this offer. I thank you for seeing it in the context and in the framework in which I have briefly outlined today. And I look forward to the results and the outcomes of this exercise manifest itself in a new sense of discipline in Trinidad and Tobago's corporate sector and in us discharging our public duty to the people of our country. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Ducran, for a very insightful contribution. Our next speaker is Mr. Philip Marshall. Mr. Marshall is a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Trinidad and Tobago and a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of England and Wales. He currently serves as an advisor to the Minister of Finance in the Transformation Alignment Program in the Ministry of Finance. He was the Deputy Chairman of Ernst & Young and Caribbean from 2000 to 2002, having served as the country's manager and partners of Ernst & Young Trinidad and Tobago from 1992 to 2000. In the integration of the firm's Caribbean practices, he became the country's partner of Ernst & Young Jamaica served as the chairman of the Corporate Governance Committee of the Private Sector Organization of Jamaica. His focus has been on corporate governance and the governance of IT and business processes in positioning the strategic value of IT in terms of IT business alignment, performance improvement, and risk management framework. His presentation today is titled The Governing Role of Directors of State Enterprises, Identifying the Performance Drivers of Good Governance. I now welcome Mr. Marshall to the podium. Good morning, everyone. Minister in the Minister, Ministry of Finance, the Honorable Winston Ducran, members of the head table, 
permanent secretaries and staff of the Ministry of Finance, chairmen and directors of state boards, CEOs and members of state enterprises, distinguished guests, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming out in such numbers today. My presentation, I believe, Marlene, is half an hour. So if you could bear with me during that period of time. Thank you. I've entitled the, this presentation to be Identifying the Performance Drivers of Good Governance. And I would then share the basic headlines of the presentation. We're going to go through a theoretical model of governance, the governance model, the expected role of directors, aligning the board's governance processes with the strategic goals of the enterprise, then what is known as the strategic control assurance plan, and then the culture and context of the organization. The governance model. This model shows, and I just have made a slight error here, under shareholders, it should have included shareholders and line ministers. But the basic model is the board is accountable to the shareholders, corporation soul, and the line ministers. The board is the representative of the shareholders and must hold themselves accountable for meeting the expectations of the Ministry of Finance and the line ministry for the agreed financial and non-financial objectives. Just as a slight aside, in New Zealand, for example, um, the boards of directors actually enter into a formal arrangement called a statement of intent with those dual ministers. In other words, a formal business plan of what their deliverables and outcomes are going to be. I continue with the model which shows that the board is responsible for the management of performance through the CEO of the organization. The CEO reports to the board, the board as a collective whole. The importance in Trinidad Tobago of the unitary board where when decisions are made, the board as a whole makes the decisions. And similarly, the board of directors manages the performance of the company through one individual and one individual only, the CEO. As you see on the chart on the right, the board will hold the CEO accountable for the end results and outcomes as stated, financial or non-financial objectives. The CEO in turn leading the organization has to ensure that all underlying obligations of the organization on the left in terms of meeting reporting and compliance requirements for regulatory bodies, revenue agencies, legal compliance, industry standards, bankers, capital providers, suppliers, customers, and employees, that they meet and fulfill their operational obligations as established by the policies of the board. For corporate governance, to be transparent, there must be clear articulation between the board of directors and the CEO on what aspects the board reserves the right to make decisions on. The CEO must understand, therefore, that if there are any limitations to his or her decision making, this is clearly articulated. So there is a clear understanding how the board shares power with the CEO. Naturally, this will be backed up by specific performance measures that are expressed not only in terms of financial or profit objectives, because many state enterprises and special purpose organizations also have social objectives added to their profit objectives. And this must be taken into consideration. So it is not necessarily that you are looking at the quantum of profit of whether the board did a good job or not. A critical aspect of the board, therefore, in its evaluation of itself or 
an evaluation of the board itself must be the board ability to deliver outcomes that are aligned to its mission. Organizations are established for a purpose and with the passage of time, this purpose may become slightly dissipated in the minds of the people who lead the organizations and we lose focus on what was the original mission and possibly do not go about a formal process of measuring the effectiveness of the mission and its impact on the community that it was intended to serve. You see on the chart a blue line. I would like to call that line the touch line. And if you will allow me the liberty of drawing an analogy with one of my favorite football teams. Sir Alex Ferguson stands on the touch line. He is like a board member. The CEO and the management team are on the field of play. How often do you see Sir Alex Ferguson cross the touch line and enter into the field of play? Never. The board must understand it stands at the touch line. It can have oversight, it can have governance, it could shout words of encouragement, but it cannot, on an ad hoc basis, enter the field of play. And similarly, it would be very unusual for somebody in the field of play to come by the touch line and stand shoulder to shoulder to Sir Alex and countermand or bark out similar orders. It must be clear, it must be absolutely clear, the decisions that the board will reserve for itself and the decisions that the CEO and the management team are expected. The board ensures that the mission is accomplished. It does so by ensuring that appropriate policies are developed and communicated, and it's the role of the CEO to implement. The board implements through one individual and one individual only, the CEO. It must establish performance measures so that the performance of the CEO and the performance of the organization can be transparently understood. This is a broad process model of the governance process flow. By the way, you all will be getting copies of this presentation electronically and some further detail um, later on. There are different process flow models, but these are seven that I have laid out. One, the board is appointed, the chair is appointed, and the chair and the board have the right to establish their committees. Naturally, by law, an audit committee must be established. Second point, I just refer to that, very important. The CEO and the board de develop their intended relationships, their power sharing. The board delegates its authority to the CEO. The CEO in turn in the organization de delegates his authority to management. There must be performance that is established and articulated in terms of end results. The minister just spoke about it. So often we refer to outputs and not outcomes. I have a slide that will deal with that later on. But the end results of the purpose of the organization is not only financial results, it also is non-financial results. Management limits refer to items in the policy in which we articulate the decision-making scope of management. Item three, the board or the new board together with the CEO and his team make sure that they articulate to the board what are the stakeholders that are served by the organization? What are the needs of those stakeholders? What are the expectations and obligations to those stakeholders? We must remember in the wider context, a state enterprise is not the same as a publicly held traded company. A state enterprise very often can be used by a government to help be a channel of deployment of policy. So it's a wider context. 
and understanding what are the expectations and obligations and the community of stakeholders may actually be the civil community, not just simply shareholders. Target outcomes are established jointly and the potential risks and rewards are articulated. The other aspect of the process flow that you see there mainly lie at the feet of management. What are the operational strategies? What are the strategic outcomes and assumptions on which those strategies have been built? What will be the risk management processes, internal control and compliance, and the crisis response of the organization? And the very important risk, business continuity. The board is not expected to do these things. The board, however, is expected to ensure that management does it, that management establishes policies and processes that are tested, that frameworks are established, and through every level of the organization, the actions that are required in these policies are inculcated by training and continuous supervision and development of the members of the organization. Item five, monitor performance, measure outcomes, and information processing. There must be measurement at all levels of an organization, from the shop floor to the board level. Usually, you would find that critical measures are expressed in non-financial terms, what I call drivers of performance, because these drivers of performance really are the ones that make sure that your intended outcomes are realized. Those of you who have studied the whole concept of the balanced scorecard would have come across the whole issue of terms of leading indicators and lagging indicators. Very often, we use financial measures as a performance indicator. But financial measures such as revenue and cost of sales are not a driver of performance because every single company uses revenue as a measure. A financial measure is really just simply a historical manifestation of how you have managed the company. What is really important is to get down to the details of understanding in your company what creates profit. What are the value drivers? How do we engage with a customer? What specific differentiation are we able to offer for us to win in the marketplace? These are the issues that need to be captured. Generally, they will be non-financial measures of performance that will be allocated to key managers throughout the organization, and their performance should be measured on this. And what the board must also understand was whether the hypothesis developed by management that measuring or focusing on a specific performance driver will result in a certain result, outcome or financial result, that must be continually tested. That is what strategy is. Strategy is saying, if we go into the marketplace and if we're competing against certain organizations, how do we differentiate ourselves? What business processes, knowledge, people, customer connection do we do differently that would make us win. Strategy is about differentiation. One of the things I've seen very often is that very often in a strategic plan, people will put as a strategy acquiring a resource, put in a new computer system, or build a warehouse. That is not a strategy. Because if your competitor already has a computer system and already has a warehouse, there's no differentiation. Strategy may be about how do you use the location of that warehouse? How do you use the geographical positioning or different channels to gain in the marketplace? The only resource that I would say fits into strategy is the intellectual resource, the competency and the learning of your people. Very often board members focus on the financials because of naturally the legal emphasis on it. But I personally feel that board members should begin to focus on the things that truly drive sustainability and profit. That's the intangible assets of an organization, the intellectual assets of the organization, the knowledge of the individual staff, the quality of the business processes, the quality of the information available and information systems to enhance decision making. Most importantly, the culture in the organization. What is the teamwork? How do managers in an organization are they prepared to develop others? How do we ensure correct succession planning for continued sustainability of an organization? 
I will just use an example. What's the difference between knowledge and intellectual capital? Knowledge or intellectual learnings, very often it's held in the mind of an individual. At 4.30 or 5.30 or 6.30, when that person leaves to go home, the intellectual capital has left the organization. How do we take that knowledge and use informal knowledge management systems, retain that knowledge for the use of others? So the organization develops processes based around that knowledge. And we get to a stage of what is known as process-based competencies and competency-based processes. Because the data, the systems infrastructure, the knowledge and the know-how are all part of your business process. Unless these things are formally recorded and trapped, what organizations will continue to do is to learn separately in their various functional silos, and you'd probably find that the same question is answered over and over again, when in fact, it should be trapped, made available, and easily retrieved for organizational development as the years go by. And I'm sure in the public servants, we all know how when people retire with experience, we say that learning is lost. So how do we create the intellectual capital in our organization? I think it's important for board members, therefore, to also ensure that the behaviors of developing others is institutionalized. We must remember something. Knowledge is power. People don't share power easily. So how do we put in place, how do we put in place encouragement for people to share knowledge? I can understand the reason. You have two guys in the department. One is prepared to work all weekend, learn, research, file, go on the net, use this knowledge, apply it the next week. Somebody else may want to go and play football or cricket, not put in the same effort. And then when they come to work the next week, you tell the guy who spent all his weekend building his information, building an important asset for the benefit of the company to say, well, why don't you share this with an employee? So we have to have differentiation between people who create knowledge and encourage knowledge sharing so the entire capability of the organization is improved. The role of directors and their responsibilities. You're gonna have all of this later on, so I don't want to spend too much time just reading through. Important that the directors oversee the quality of control and accountability systems. Important the board sets out in advance the parameters by which the chief executive officer and the performance of the organization is going to be measured. And where appropriate, ratifying the appointment or displacement or lateral promotion of senior executives. Usually this might be done in conjunction with the line minister with advice. Providing input into final approval of management and the development of corporate strategy. Next point, very important, reviewing, ratifying, and monitoring systems of risk management and internal control, codes of conduct, and legal compliance. Monitoring seniors, executives' performance and implementation of strategy and ensuring appropriate resources are available to senior executives. Approving and monitoring the progress of major capital expenditure financial reporting, naturally acting consistently within the enterprise objectives and ensuring the enterprise performs its functions efficiently. The state enterprise must operate in a financially responsible manner, managing its assets and liabilities, and naturally in relation to the Companies Act, making sure that all the obligations are fulfilled. I now go into the board's governance processes. How do we ensure that they are aligned with the strategic goals of the enterprise? 
You might not be able to read this model, you will get it on the slide, but basically it talks about the whole issue on the cycle of strategic development, planning, implementation, and um, reporting and review. The management of an organization will be one because of their industry experience will come to the board and articulate to the board the strategic direction. The board is in the slight challenge. They may not have the expertise. They must not attempt to second guess the management. On any critical decisions, they should be free to get outside professional help and advice. This is critical. The minister spoke about this critical for state enterprises, in fact, all enterprises. We talk mainly in terms of organizations' outputs. This chart attempts to show the difference between the two. You have the two boxes on the left, cost and the inputs into a process. And that is classified as economy. Are we purchasing things well? Um, what's the cost of the inputs? And most of our budgeting processes and reporting processes in the public service today, it's about you have the budget, you have the line item budget, and if you maintain your costs according to the agreed inputs, well, you've done a good job. We have to move beyond that. We have to now say, what are the outputs, the level of outputs we intended to produce? For the same budget, have we produced the required levels of output activities? And most importantly, how do we connect outputs and outcomes? Not an easy link between outputs and outcomes. Outcomes are where we may want to impact the behavior of a community, maybe the behavior of our clan base. So the link between outputs and outcomes is really about behavior change, winning over customers in serving them. This is all part of the Transformation Green Paper recently published. To be able to do that, we must survey our customers in absolute detail. We must understand the aspirations, the specific needs and preferences of our customers. And very often, what companies do, they of course segment their customers or their market segment according to customer needs. So we have the concept of mass customization, where every customer feels as if he's been attended to as an individual. This type of process will demonstrate to a customer that this company that I'm dealing with is prepared to re-engineer its internal processes to deliver what I need, when I need, at the, quality, at the quality that I desire. So in the performance monitoring manual, you will see a section, I think it precedes the section in performance management and the balance scorecard, where we speak about out outcomes, and really, it's just not different to strategic planning. It's part of strategic planning, but in doing your strategic planning process, it's important that the directors ask of the management team, what are the additional outcomes apart from the financial outputs do we hope to achieve by the endeavors of this state enterprise or special purpose entity? Because your results impacts on the community at large. In a sense, I suppose you could say outcomes touches on the whole aspects of corporate social responsibility. The next slide you are not going to be able to read, but is on page 117 of your performance monitoring manual. Page 117. If you have it in front, you could look at it. What this is, is this is a governance strategy map for the board. This is the board sitting back and saying, what are the processes that we, the board, must follow to ensure we govern properly? This is not a strategy map of the business operations of the company. It is a strategy map relating to the processes of the board. Again, those with familiarity with the balance scorecard will see that we have four different perspectives. Start at the top, enterprise contribution, shareholder value, board governance processes, learning and growth. Let's start at the bottom, learning and growth. What this is saying is, to develop an organization's capability, what should the board members themselves do in developing themselves? I'll just read quickly some of the um, highlights there. Areas to be measured, board knowledge and skills. 
the ability to oversee the strategic direction, knowledge of the regulatory policy. Next one, ensure board committees have access to strategic information and outcome indicators. Next one, foster board member and top management dialogue. Then also ensure that risk management leadership and risk management structure and a risk management policy exists. These are all development, learning and growth foundations which must exist for an organization to carry out effectively the processes which are on the line above. That is how processes, especially as we move towards more challenging regulatory environments, regulatory environments and information process reporting can only do or succeed on a foundation of absolute competence, learning and growth held at all levels in an organization. The specific chart is talking about the learning and growth required of a board. Just let me repeat the major headlines, however, of the board governance processes. Four, of starting in left, strategy management major area of the board to ensure that management puts in place processes to manage strategy. The board is not managing the strategy. The board is ensuring that the organization has in place processes to manage the strategy. Financial oversight. The board must ensure that there are processes to maintain financial oversight and they themselves will be part of that process in the whole issue of the audit committee and monthly board reportings. Staff oversight, very critical for the board to ensure that in place are adequate succession plans and learning and development for key positions and that there is teamwork and growth. Last point, enterprise risk management. Enterprise risk management is not the responsibility of one individual or one department. It is the responsibility of every single individual in an organization. What the board has to ensure is that management undertakes a critical assessment of all the different risks and risk events that an entity can be exposed to. Then they design and develop the mitigation strategies and responses if those events ever occur. They feed back to the board what is any residual exposure based on their plans. The board approves that any residual exposure is within the risk appetite of the board and approves, therefore, the risk management strategy and plan. What is important in this is that risk management is not separate to any other business process. Risk management must be built into every single business process. It must be part Risk management and compliance must be a component of each business process. Because if you don't do that, you're going to have whole departments and oodles of people just doing risk management. I'm saying part of your day-to-day -day operational process must have embedded in it risk management. Risk management responsibilities should appear in every single job description. Every single job description. The board must insist that there are formal reports on the training in risk management and internal auditors and external auditors and even the management should be asked to report on the effectiveness of the controls within the processes that address the risk management strategies as articulated and agreed upon by the board. The board must continuously get that feedback that it is in fact operational and it is not just simply a theory that is espoused. It must be internalized and institutionalized in the organization. But you can see it in more detail. Quick overview. Marlene, how am I going? How many moments? How many moments? Five minutes, ten minutes? Okay, fine. This slide says corporate governance is an organization's strategic response to risk. The purpose of this slide is to say, as a board member, how do I come to grips with all these responsibilities being put on my shoulder without running onto the field of play 
on understanding what is happening in detail. Well, this attempts to assuage some of those fears. In the center, it says the strategic control assurance plan. Your strategic plan or your business plan is the key centerpiece of what the board must review. The board, therefore, is one of five control elements. And the five control elements are there. is the strategic control assurance plan, the board, the organization itself, management assurance, and independent assurance. I will just take you through these things very quickly. The board, based on the strategic or business plans that have been developed, ensure on the basis of reports 